right, so if you have a Bible, open up to John chapter 4. We are continuing in the series of encounters. Uh, encounters with Jesus. As Jesus has encounters with different people through the book of John. And so that's what we'll be looking at uh, for the next whatever. Um, who knows? It'll be until the Lord tells me to stop uh, uh, this series and start another one. But we know... The worst part about it for me is that there's some of these passages like, man, I just preached on that passage, and oh well. Uh, so uh, I preached on this one as well. I've heard all kinds of titles for this uh, message uh, for this woman in John 4 uh, that I won't repeat, um, but uh, the next names for the woman at the well. Uh, and, and she just had a question. She has a, a, a need for something. She runs into Jesus. And so we're going to look at this passage. Uh, the worship team today, it's kind of funny, we were up here practicing this morning and, and just, you know, it was just, it was kind of lethargic because we're all half away. Babies keeping people up all night, noises in houses keeping people up, moving, all kinds of stuff. People just like working too much. So everybody was like half away. So I'm glad to see we all woke up to worship. All this drinks and coffee, and we're all better now. All right. So in John chapter 4, you have this encounter with Jesus and a woman at the well. And so we're going to get into that, and I want to kind of set the stage for what a divine encounter is, because this is a divine encounter, and we'll I'll explain what that means in a minute. So in John chapter 4, we're not going to waste any more time chasing squirrels, so we're going to start in verse 1. It says, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself was not baptizing his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. And he had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I'm just going to stop there for a second. We're going to kind of look at this divine encounter as we go through it. And so you see Jesus is going from one place to another. And so he has to move from Judea uh, uh, to go into Galilee. But the only way to do that is to take a longer route and go around Samaria um, or go through Samaria. Now, not to pick on certain cities, but I know that when I was growing up, and we could, had to go places on trips, and you've probably heard me say this before, but you're going to hear it again. But if you go on a trip, there was and Dad would look for any way to not go through Chicago. Uh, is there any way possible to not go through Chicago? Stephanie, I love going through Chicago. But that was one of the things that, that he would do. He would like, I'll do anything if I don't have to go through Chicago. If we had to go through Chicago, nobody talks. There's no talking. No talking, no yelling, no nothing. Good luck in that in our car. I'm trying to stop Evan from saying anything, ever. But you can see that, you know, it was like, oh, I don't want to go through Chicago. Now, it doesn't bother me. But maybe for you, it's like if I have to go south, and we've driven to Florida a few times, um, I really would pay money if I could avoid what city? Anybody know? Atlanta. Ugh, it's horrible. Uh, I don't mind the city so much, but traffic is, if you think, Dad, if you think Chicago's bad, good grief. These people really don't know how to drive. And so in Atlanta, it was just terrible. It always has been every time I go. And it's like a parking lot. So you would do anything you could to avoid Atlanta. But here, Jesus has to go. And so you could go the long way around, or you could go through Samaria. Now, people don't want to go through Samaria, and here's why. Uh, the Samaria is filled with Samaritans who are like half Jew, half Gentile. So they're half breeds to the Jews. And so a person who is a disciplined Jew would not go through Samaria. They hated each other. They absolutely hated each other. And so for Jesus to go through Samaria, and uh, I don't use the King James, uh, I did grow up on the King James, but one of the great translations of this little passage it says, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And it's because 
the emphasis is upon the fact that he had to go through there. He didn't. He did not have to go through there. In fact, he wouldn't have if he was a good Jew. You would go around. You don't go through. But there was some reason that he had to go through. And I would put this out to you that this was God's divine moment to have his son listen and go where he wanted him to go. And he went to Samaria because he had an appointment to meet somebody at 6 o'clock. He just didn't know it. And so in Samaria, here we have this woman. So he, you know, you can imagine as they're deciding, okay, so I do go left here, take a left turn to Albuquerque, go around, or do I go through Samaria? And, and all the disciples, I'm just imagining in my head because that's what I do, uh, they're all like ready to go around because that's what we do. We go around, we're going to take a left and go around, and Jesus keeps going straight. And they're like, ah, uh, Jesus, where are you going? What are you doing? Uh, we're going this way. We're going through Samaria. Why? Why would we ever go through that place? And some of you have to understand that this was, this was a place that, that you would avoid. Fearful. Things could happen there. You could get robbed. All kinds of things can happen there. It's the growing up, even, even when we, were, we had moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and there were parts of Louisville we stayed away from uh, because it was just scary. Um, we don't have scary places. Some of you may think the Beltline is scary. Some of you think certain areas, you know, the north side of Madison is scary. That's not scary. There's nothing, it is not like that. And so people to go through Samaria was taking a risk, and it was a big risk. And so they went this way. And so here's Jesus. He has his divine moment where he's going to meet somebody. And apparently it's a woman. So it says that he sits down. Listen to what it says. And Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. In case you were wondering, he got tired. He got tired from walking. It tells us that. And so he's worn out and he sits down at the well. Because what do you do when you sit down at the well? You get some water, right? So a woman comes up about six in the evening and she wants some water to get draw some water. Not a, you know, she's coming when probably nobody else is going to be there. Everybody else is cooking dinner and got dinner at home. And she's there when nobody else is going to come, figuring, I'm just going to get my water and go. And that plays into the story a little later. But, you know, I just want to get my water and get out of here. And she runs into this guy named Jesus. And she has a divine encounter. And I would just throw this out for you today, is there are times when God wants to have a holy and divine encounter with you. That should be every day. It really should be. But let's be honest, it isn't. It just isn't. It's not, it doesn't work that way for me. I wish it was. I would be like, oh, and you know, and every place I went would be a divine encounter. And I could pray as hard as I want. God, change my spiritual eyes so I could see everything the way you see it. But I'm a human. And I'm a guy. It's two things going against me. <laughs> and I don't always, I'm not the most observant. So I don't always see the divine moments. There are times, as I've shared in the past, where I'll sit at a restaurant and God's like, talk to the woman serving you, talk to the person serving you or the guy, talk to them. No, no, we're good. We don't need to talk to this person. And God's saying, you, you missed your divine moment. This is a woman at the well and you missed it, buddy. And I just wonder how many times is God going to show his grace to me when I keep missing the divine moments. Okay, so let's keep walking there. We have these moments. We need to have divine moments with God, and what do we do with them when we have one? Okay, so it says in verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus says to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. I already read that, but you're going to hear it again. Listen to what she says. How is it that you, two things, a Jew would ask me or ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jew, what are you doing here? Me, a Samaritan, bad. Woman, even worse. Why would you, a man, ask me, a Samaritan woman? That's crazy. What are you doing? And, and ask me for a drink, because wouldn't you be all unclean if you got a drink from me? You see, she was missing the point. She was caught up in her own legalistic world. You see, the Samaritans had a different view. They had their own version of the, of the Pentateuch, of the first five books of the Bible, and they had a different take, and they had their own theology, and they were screwed up. I'm sorry, but they were. 
They really were. Because they took the scriptures and they twisted them to fit their life. And that's what this woman was doing. And the Jews were doing the same thing with the Samaritans by ignoring them and, and not being what Jesus wants to do. And so here's Jesus in the middle of this divine encounter. So he says, Jesus answers, If you knew the gift of God and who, it, who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Now, listen to what she says. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket. And the well is deep, easily 100 feet deep, that well. So where are you going to get this living water? I, I can just see, where am I going to get this living water you're talking about? Does it crawl out of, the, out of the well? And it's easy to look at her and say, not very bright. But just remember a chapter earlier, the Jew, the leader, part of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus. What is this born again? Do I got to crawl back into mom's womb and be born again? He didn't get it either. So we have two instances of people that don't quite get what Jesus is saying. And if you're here today and you've read the Bible and you go, I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm just here to tell you, hey, you know what? There's hope for you. There is hope. Don't give up and let God begin to illuminate these things. So this woman's the same deal. She's, he's like, where am I going to get this living water you're talking about? What is this living water? So she says, aren't you greater, verse 12, aren't you, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? They're going through Jacob. And, and, and they're taking this, it's again, the Samaritan in her the teaching that she's had, even their very twisting of the scripture, is taking this little phrase. You're not greater than Jacob, are you? It's a part of her theology. Growing up, she doesn't understand who Jesus is, and why should she? She's never encountered him. Jesus hasn't been in Samaria yet. And so this is an interesting thing that she says. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his son and, and his livestock. She's thinking Jacob, the guy who made the well. The guy who made it. Are you better than him? Are you better than him? She's not getting it, but she will. And Jesus says, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. So he's, he's got to be like, okay, I'm going to explain it to you this way. Everyone who drinks from this water, pointing in the well, maybe to her bucket, is going to thirst again. Like right now, really thirsty. Really wish I could have a drink. I'm glad Saul's not here because I'm going to have a Diet Mountain Dew as soon as I walk out the door. <laughs> um, but I... I'm thirsty, but you know how you, you drink, and if I go to a restaurant, if you can't keep up with me, there's going to be four, there's five. That's why I don't drink alcohol, because I'd be drunk every time I left. Um, so, I, you know, the pop's got to keep flowing. If you drink this, you're going to be thirsty. This kind of water, you drink this water, you're going to get thirsty again. But listen to what he says. He says, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never th get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. So he is saying to her, it's not about the water, physical water. And of course, we're all smart. We get what, what Jesus is saying because we're after the story. But he's saying it's not about this water. You'll get thirsty again. But if you drink my water, if you drink me, he's equating the living water with who? Him right? He's saying not only will you not ever be thirsty again, but rather you will actually become a well springing up. That life of eternal life flowing through you. And I would dare say that some of us need to have our well checked. There are times, and maybe you've seen, you remember baby Jessica. Do you remember that? Gosh, that had to be 20 some years ago, right? She fell in the well. It was all the nation was captivated and how they, they got her out alive. I don't know why I brought that up, but I just remember. And you have this well in this hole. And you can just imagine, I think, spiritually think, that our wells are dry. And God is yelling in our well, Hello! 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 Because there's no water in it. Because it's a little dry. The Bible tells us that it needs to flow. It needs to flow out of us. And so there is this sense that when we are dry, we go to the one who is the water. Who do we run through to? We run to Jesus. 
unfortunately, so many times we run to family, we run to friends, we run to this, we run to that, media, you name it. We don't run to him first when our well is dry. And so there's this sense that we keep forgetting that we have everything we need within us, but somehow we aren't the well springing up. The divine moment maybe that God wants to have with you today is time for me to flow out of your well. Time for me to fill you up some more so you're flowing. So you're flowing. Sir, said the woman to him, give me this water and I won't get thirsty and I'll and come here to draw water. She's still thinking physical, not spiritual. So Jesus seizes the opportunity to keep it on the spiritual. So he says, go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. And she says to him, and she's honest. You know, we're usually not honest with God. We like to not be honest with him. I don't have a husband, she answers. You have answered correctly. I just, I'm sorry, sometimes I read that phrase and I've read it hundreds and hundreds of times. And I think to myself, I just, Jesus has a game for it, game show voice announcer. You have answered correctly. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands and the man you're now with isn't your husband. So what you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped. Our... Hello. I see you're a prophet. Now we're going to talk about worship. I don't want to talk about my sin. No talking about sin. No. Talking about sin in church, that's not popular. You know, I'm not listening. La, 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 la. Right? I don't want to talk about that. Don't talk about my private life. That is out of bounds. Guess who talked about somebody's private life? Jesus. And I'm just reading what he said. So he says, hey, go get your hubby. Ah, uh, I don't have a husband. She didn't lie. She was honest. I don't have a husband. I've had five other ones, and now I'm living with a dude. And now she's going to change the subject. Let's change the subject. No talk about sin. Maybe your divine encounter is to address a sin problem. The first one I gave you is maybe your divine encounter is to realize your well is a little dry. The second one is maybe you need to realize that you have a sin problem and you don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, God. Guess what? Jesus does want to talk about it. Oh, but you want to talk about worship? Okay, we'll keep it on the spiritual, so Jesus does. He said what he needed to say. Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. She's bringing back her theology again. You, they worshiped on this mountain and and the Jews did in, in, in Jerusalem. So, you know, I want to ask you a really deep spiritual question, Jesus. I don't want to deal with my sin. Let's talk about spiritual things. Okay, so he does. Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Case in point, Samaritans, you're wrong. That's Jesus telling them, you're wrong. Okay? Jesus doesn't nicey-nice it. He says that you're wrong. Because salvation, he says, we worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews, not the Samaritans. But an hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. She knew that there was a Messiah to come. She knew that much, and she had the opportunity to speak to the one. And he explained worship. And when worship becomes I heard this this week, uh, Ken Davis on the radio this week. I'll put my own interpretation on If you come this week and you come to church on Sunday so you can see a few friends and, and you know, give somebody a hug because maybe nobody hugged you all week so you're looking for somebody to give you a hug, somebody will give you a hug here unless you're like, don't hug me. Um, we know who you are. You have little <laughs> signs that say, don't hug me. Um, maybe you want to come to see some friends. Maybe you think, 
you know, the worship band's awesome and you want to hear what song they're going to do, you want to hear that kind of thing, maybe you think I'm awesome and you're hoping that you'll hear something great from me, you're missing it. That's not worshiping him in spirit and truth. When you worship him in spirit and truth, you abandon everything that is yours, everything that you think is important to you, and you come in and you lay it before God, and you say to God, God, I am here to meet you. I want you to do something, and I want to walk out of here not talking about how the band did this, or they did a great song, or they messed this up, or I'd have done that better, or What kind of message was that? Or did you see what he was wearing? Oh, goodness, did you see what she's wearing? Oh, my gosh, somebody had a tattoo. Did you see this, that, 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 whatever? It was too long. The service is too long. You walk out of here, and guess what? Life's the same as it was when you walked in because you're missing it. And Jesus is saying, you worship in spirit and truth. When you walk out of here, you walk out of here saying, God is good, and he wants to do some things in my life, and he wants to change some things about me, and there are some things that I need to work on. You don't come to Transformation Church to come to stay the same. That's not transformation. That's called staying the same. In fact, perhaps we should have a new name for churches around. Stay the same church. Come just as you are. Leave just as you are. (laughs) Sorry, that's my little jab at the little come just as you are. You can come. Don't leave the same. Leave different. Leave transformed. Have Jesus do a work in you. So, okay, so we're doing this. Let's keep walking through this. Then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed at that he was talking to a woman. Shocker. Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Like Jesus didn't know. You know, the guys are all thinking it. What is he doing? He shouldn't be talking to her. He doesn't have to say it. They didn't say it, but he knew it. And then the woman left her water jar, went into town. Hello, what did she come for? Water. What'd she leave? Her jar. She left her jar there. What are you doing, lady? I'll tell you why. So she left her water jar, went into town, and told the... Who does she tell? People? That's not what the text says. It doesn't say people. She told the men. Because that's who she knew. All the women knew her. She's that home wrecker. She's been with five husbands. You know, you know what? Five of them might have died, or she's shacking up with so-and-so. You know what? So she came and said it to the men, because that's who she knew. And she says to them, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they left town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. And he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And the disciples said to one another, could he have brought something with him to eat? Hello, now they don't get it. (laughs) What? He's delusional. He must be starving to death. That's why he's acting like this. He's got to be hungry. What? What is he talking about, this food to eat? I have food to eat that you don't know about. Jesus, did you stash some Kit Kats in your pocket? Did I miss that? Are you sneaking in some Snickers? Is it Twix time? I don't get it. I guess in that culture, I shouldn't be so crass. Did you hide a leg of lamb somewhere? Where is that? Is there some bread that you're hiding that we don't see? Mmm, bread. The disciples said to one another, could you have brought something to eat? My food, listen to this, my food. Jesus is tired, he's exhausted, he's got to sit down. He needs some water. There's no indication that he drank any water. He's got to be tired. He's got to be hungry because the disciples went into town to get something to eat, right? So they come back with food, and he's talking about, I don't need food. I got food. And this is what he says. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The part that we miss about the Samaritan woman at the well is that the disciples are having divine encounter as well. They're being taught. And just when you think you've arrived and you know everything, because, you know, they're following Jesus around. They gave up everything to follow him. And now they're all like, what are you doing going through Samaria? Why are you talking to this woman? And now they start saying, food, food, where are you hiding the food at? They don't get it. And he's saying, my food, my sustenance, everything that I am is to do the will of the Father who sent me. Wow. And finish his work. 
And so he begins to talk about sowing and reaping. But I want you to jump down into verse 39. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him, listen, believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. Therefore, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. Now I want you to understand something. A whole city is changed. Why? Because Jesus performed some miracles? No, because he had an encounter with a woman who told me everything I ever did. You know what he did? He just pointed out that she's living with a guy, which could have been common knowledge if you lived in that town. And then they says that many believed in him because of what she said. Then eventually a bunch of them came because what? They had an encounter with Jesus. The woman at the well was just the catalyst of an encounter with God for the city. It was just the start of a conversation. It impacted the disciples because suddenly now they're hanging around for two more days in Samaria. Nobody hangs around town in Samaria. Nobody. If you were a Jew, you don't hang around. You don't go through there and you certainly don't spend the night. He spent the night. Two more nights so he could tell people and talk to people about himself. Let me ask you, when God begins to speak to your heart and you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, okay, what's that have to do with me? I believe that every Sunday is a divine encounter. Every time we come to church, it's an opportunity to have a divine encounter with him. A time to meet specifically with Jesus so that he might speak to us. He might speak to you that you're a little dry and your well is not overflowing like it should be. Cling to him. Begin to focus on him. Begin to think about more about Jesus instead of about your well, instead of about your life. Begin to think more about him, the one who fills the well with himself. Maybe he's speaking to you about a sin problem that you have, that you ha haven't been able to give up. And it's time. It's time to give it up. Maybe he's talking to you about your worship, that your worship is weak or pathetic because you've made it about a thing or something to do when it's about him. It's about the Father. It's about the Spirit. It's about all of that. And that's what it's about. How does that apply in your everyday life? Maybe he's here to tell you that you need an encounter with Jesus so that you might have living water for the very first time. And if you're that person, you're the person that I want to speak to for the next couple of minutes. The worship team's going to come up and we're going to just close with a song. Same one we just did here in your presence, because that's where we need to be. We need to be in his presence. But if you're here this morning, you've never had that encounter with Jesus, I would say to you, you know what? The first encounter with him is the one that matters. Because that's the one where you decide whether I'm going to listen and I'm going to follow or I'm going to ignore and do my own thing my own way. It reminds me of a song by Fleetwood Mac, Go Your Own Way. And too many, as, too many of us have gone our own way. Now the worship team's got that in their head, and that's great. But we have to go his way. Jesus would say, wide is the road to destruction, and many find it. Narrow is the path to eternal life.